Folks, our subject for today is a blessing or a curse. And we just read those Bible verses in our last study together. So it's kind of a good jumping off place. Really, the title is meant to be somewhat of a play on words. That verse in Deuteronomy says, Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. God speaking to the children of Israel through Moses said these words. And notice, it's not a blessing or a curse. There is a blessing and a curse. Right? And you can have either one. Choose you this day. That's, that's the kind of statement that this is. It goes on to say that they would enjoy a blessing if they would diligently hearken to the commandments of the Lord. Or they would suffer a curse if they chose to disobey God's Ten Commandments. I say it's a play on words because we can be a blessing or a curse too, can't we? Yes. Folks, if we are Christ-like, are we going to be a blessing to the world? Yes. yes, we are. Maybe like a light to the world or like salt to the world. And then too... If we're not Christ-like in our words and actions, will we be a blessing? Or will we be a curse, a curse. to those that are around us? And so, the play on words gets even worse because our real message for today is on the subject of what most people would call cursing. Actually, I need to tell you that a couple of weeks ago, while I was studying my Sabbath school lesson... I was at work and listening to the extra reading portion of the Sabbath school lesson in my headphones from my phone. And sometimes I start in a ways before the actual reading based on the chapter titles and how I think they may apply. More often I will keep listening for chapter after chapter. I usually will always restart at a time or two. Because obviously if you're listening while you're working, you're going to get distracted and things are going to happen. So I listen to it multiple times. But eventually I will usually wind up listening to chapter after chapter after chapter. Um, Amen. When I'm doing that. Yeah, it is a blessing. It very is. But somewhere in all of that, I heard God's prophet say that the ministers today need to give more practical messages. In other words, messages that cover practical Christianity. One place she says practical godliness. That's right. Well, someone had mentioned this subject to me a while back, and I was reminded of this as being a very practical message. And I went back and tried to find that statement in the spirit of prophecy and could not find it. But as I searched, I did find some other ones, and I want to share them as an introduction to our study today. This one says, The Lord here shows us that the message to be, to be born to His people by ministers whom He has called to warn the people is not a peace and safety message. You know what the Bible says? They cry peace and safety and what? Sudden destruction comes. It's not a peace and safety message. It is not merely theoretical, but practical in every particular. The people of God are represented in the message to the Laodiceans in a position of carnal security. They are at ease, believing themselves in an exalted condition of spiritual attainments. I don't want to be fooled like that. We love the truth, right? right. Yeah. We hate lies. So don't we want to be aware of our real condition? Think about it. The worst thing, Spirit of Prophecy says, the worst thing that can happen to a person is to believe that they're all right when in fact they're all wrong. And I don't want to be like that. My ministering brethren, as you stand before the people, speak of those things that are essential. Those things that will 
instruct. Teach the great practical truths that must be brought into the life. Practical things. What is that talking about? That's everyday life, right? What matters the most? How we live from day to day or how we preach and teach and talk when we're here on Sabbath? Actions speak louder than words. Even though my subject today is about our words. But actions do speak louder than words. So it's not just today that we're talking about. Theoretical discourses are essential that people may see the chain of truth link after link, uniting in a perfect whole, but no discourse should ever be preached without presenting Christ and Him crucified as the foundation of the gospel. Ministers would reach more hearts if they would dwell more upon practical godliness. And then this last one says, Oh, why do not ministers give to the churches the very food which will give them spiritual health and vigor? The result will be a rich experience in practical obedience to the Word of God. Why do the ministers not strengthen the things that remain that are ready to die? As you can tell, I was searching the word practical, looking for the statement that I couldn't find. And there's some wonderful things that are said about this. So, this is what I want to do here today with the subject at hand. Folks, we are living in a society that has lost the ability to blush. Joe Cruz told the story several years ago. He was, he was doing a revival um, series that I had the privilege of hearing. And he told the story about going to Australia to preach a series of, you know, evangelistic series. And on Sabbath, in between their meetings, you know, it seems like all churches have places they like to go and walk or, or, or whatever. And and on Sabbath afternoon, they wanted to take Joe Cruz down to the Golden Coast of Australia and take him for a walk on what they said is the most beautiful and wonderful beaches in the world. And I've seen those beaches in, in videos and stuff, and, and you make a pretty good argument for, for that area. It's, it's super nice. There's such an amazing coral reef there. But they take him out. And when they got to the beach, Joe's looking around, and the women aren't wearing tops. It was topless. And, of course, Joe is embarrassed. He's, he's mortified. He's blushing. But when he questioned the Adventist people about it, they said, oh, that's just the way it is around here. You know, they, In other words, they've been around it so long they've gotten used to it. And he was telling the story for the purpose of saying that the world has lost the ability to blush at things. But God forbid that we do, that his people do. Well, you know, I grew up in a world where women were modest. And men didn't need to be. And if you think about that, it'll make sense to you. I grew up in a world where the majority of the people at least tried to be decent men and women. And folks, the indecent ones were expected to stay on the other side of the tracks. I also grew up in a world where if a decent lady or child wandered to the other side of the tracks, the indecent men would not say indecent things in front of the women and children. Right? And folks, I grew up in a world where you weren't allowed to say dirty words in public, let alone on TV. Okay, I grew up in a world where if you did say a dirty word, 
you were prone to get your mouth washed out with ivory soap. Anybody ever experience that? I did. I really did. I experienced that. And she did it. <laughs> she was a mom that did that. And folks, I apologize for what's on the screen. But today, those three letters on the screen are the norm. They have become normalized. And nobody seems to be blushing about that or anything else today. It's everywhere, and it's almost everyone. You know, I didn't think that I would live to have my grandchildren come to visit me in my home. And every other sentence was this. And there was nothing we could do about it. You know, we asked them not to. We forbade them. We even talked about punishment. But the realization was there. This is, this is what they do. This is who they are. And it would be just like me trying to stop one of my habits, one of my, you know, even, you know, you say a bad habit, but a habit, period, you're accustomed to doing it. You ever have the power go off? And the power stays off for one hour, and how many light switches do you flip on during that hour? Because I'm telling you, every time you walk through a door, boom, you reach over and flip it off. See, it's a habit. And you really cannot help yourself. It's going to take more than an hour to get that problem fixed, right? And that's the way it is with our grandchildren. This is how they live. This is how they talk. And it hurts us. But you can't fix it in an hour. And besides, they'd go home and get it all over again, wouldn't they? I apologize up front. I'm going to be as kind in my presentation today as I can, but I'm also going to be very real. Okay? Everywhere you turn, even if you don't watch TV, folks, it's effing this and effing that. And there's about... Ten different ways that that can be expressed. And effing is one of them. I mean, what I'm saying is one of them. And if you're like me, you find that just as offensive as if they were saying the real word. But again, this is the norm now. We've lost the ability to blush. In James chapter 3... Verses 7 and 8, it says, For every kind of beast and bird and serpent and things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. We can go out there and we can get any animal out there and we can tame them some which away to do our bidding, to do what we want them to do. But verse 8 says, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Now, can I tame my tongue? No. no. Can you tame your tongue? No. So if we've got a problem, we're going to need something more than ourselves to fix the problem, right? Right. We absolutely are. Verse 9 says, Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Listen, out of the same mouth proceeds blessings and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Amen? Amen? What are we about? Blessing or cursing? Blessing, blessing. Can we properly 
bless God and praise His name with a mouth that we use to curse and curse and curse? That's the question at hand. But James goes on, verse 11, Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine, figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. So what is he really saying here, folks? You can't really be both ways. And if we are both ways, we're fooling ourselves. And so we need to get some help, don't we? We need some fixing. All right. I'm going to approach the subject of cussing. That's how we say it in Georgia, right? It doesn't have a G on the end. Cussing, yeah. I didn't want anybody to think I was talking about their cousin. Anyway. Um, I'm going to approach this from three ways because it really can be three different subjects, if you will. Number one is taking God's name in vain. That's a very important part of what we think cussing is or what we say cussing is. And then there's cursing or swearing, and I mean that in a literal sense. And then there's just plain foul language or dirty words. Okay, so in order to cover this, we're going to break it down into three parts and talk about them individually. So let's begin with taking God's name in vain. Folks, is there one commandment that is worse to break than all of the others? No. That's a tough question. And I have my moments where I wonder, but please bear with me as I kick some ideas around here today. The first commandment, it's number one, right? I mean, it is the first commandment. So it seems that means something right out of the gate. And not only that, but the first commandment has to do with the very subject of being number one too, doesn't it? I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Well, a lot of people might make the argument that that would be the most uh, important of the Ten Commandments, and I certainly would not argue against it. The wording here leaves something to be desired to me, as I don't think it proper to have other gods that come in second or third to God either. Okay? But I know that's not what it means. That's a very important commandment. The fourth commandment. Most Adventists are pretty convinced of the importance of this commandment. And I think a lot of us have looked at this commandment as somehow being the most important commandment of them all. Don't forget about the tenth commandment. We talked about it in our Sabbath school class. And that wasn't planned. Thou shalt not covet. It is the last commandment, and being placed the last could give it emphasis as well, couldn't it? You know, usually the first is very important. The last is important like that. But we're told that that last commandment, thou shalt not covet, is kind of the foundation of all the other commandments. And we talked about that for a moment or two this morning. But then there are those who say there cannot be any one commandment that is more important than all the rest. They are all equal. And folks, I know that breaking the least commandment is enough to keep us out of God's kingdom, right? And so in that respect, I certainly agree with this statement. But aside from that, Do we really believe the person who steals a pencil from work is equal to the one who murders his wife and his children? Well, if you break one, you break them all, and I do agree with that. But that has to do with the penalty of sin. Every sin has the same penalty, but every sin is not equal, Arthur. Nobody believes that. 
I, I'll promise you, folks, if you're going to commit a break a commandment against me, please sell my pencils. <laughs> please don't kill me. Does that make sense? Exodus 20, verse 7 says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. I really think that the argument can be made for this one. The third commandment says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, but then, what does it say? I will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. There is something different about this commandment, is there not? Is there something special about this commandment? There's no other commandment that says anything like this. I will not forgive you for taking my name in vain. That's what it says, right? right. It's very interesting to me. Again, I think this challenges our thinking about this commandment. Does anyone think that this is saying that you can murder your whole family and I will forgive you for those sins, but if you say, OMG, I will not forgive you? Is that what this is trying to say? Folks, that doesn't make sense to any of us. Although I still want to caution you, that the one may be the spiritual lesson about the other. And so I sure don't want to be guilty of watering down the reverence and respect of God's holy name by using it unwisely. And that's what OMG and a lot of these other curse words really are. Right? Right? But obviously there's more to this commandment than meets the superficial reading of it. The word take. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. This is the Strong's Concordance definition of it. And it's very interesting to me that nowhere in the Strong's that we find the word take. And yet, take is the word that they use there. And that's not normally what I see when I look in the Strong's Concordance. Now, I heard a Jewish man talking on this subject one time, and he said that he knew the Hebrew better than most of us know our English. And then he said that the third commandment is not, thou shalt not take the name, but rather thou shalt not carry the the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And so I look it up in the Strong's Concordance. Maybe he's right. But I do understand that often when I say take something, it means the same as carry, doesn't it? I can carry you to the store. I can take you to the store. <laughs> right? Right. Um, and in fact, I think all of the words in this Strong's definition fit into this interpretation of the third commandment. But what does it mean to carry the name of the Lord? What's the difference between carry and take? His answer to this question was to do evil in the Lord's name. And that, he said, the Lord will not forgive. He's, he reasoned, when an irreligious person commits evil, it doesn't bring God and religion into disrepute. But when a religious person commits evil, especially in God's name, he not only does the evil, but he does damage to God's name, God's holy name, and to his kingdom. Right? right. Now think about it. I have seen where the common argument is made by skeptics and atheists alike. They say more people have been killed in the name of religion and even Christianity than any other single pretense in the history of the world. Isn't that right? That's right. And it very well may be a true statement. 
But listen, folks, none of those people were killed because it was God's will for them to be killed. Right? <clears throat> All of those people that died during the Dark Ages, I mean, something like 150 million of them were killed in the name of Christianity. Add to that the Crusades. Add to that my childhood where they had, you know, the Catholics and the Protestants going at it over in Northern Ireland. Was God behind any of those deaths? Absolutely not. All of those causes were fighting for things that we know God had no favor in that. Right? But we hang all of that on God. And of course, you know, we understand the atheist doing that. The skeptic doing that. But folks, that kind of killing is exactly what we are talking about here. It's taking or carrying. I don't care which word you use. But it's taking God's name in vain. That's not when you say OMG. And it's not when you say the myriad of other derogatory comments or just useless comments using God's name. Vain comments. It really has a deeper meaning than that. Now, I do think it's important to respect that because, like I say, I believe what we say is a spiritual lesson for this subject. And, folks, it is a part of it. In reality, the third commandment is not as much about what we say as what we are. But let's face it, what we say is an important part of who we are, right? right? So is this still an important subject? If we claim to be like, to be a Christian and live like the devil, are we taking God's name in vain? And if we continue down that road, folks, there is just no way that God will be able to save us. I will not hold him guiltless who takes my name in vain. Now having said all of this, isn't it amazing how many of our curse words are variations of God's name? We'll get to that in just a minute. The next portion that I want to look at is literal cursing or swearing. After all, a lot of our so-called cursing is done out of anger, right? And a lot of that is done out of anger against another person, right? So you can easily understand where the term cursing comes from. Literally. The word damn, and I apologize, but I don't know another way to do it without saying it. Literally, the word damn, what does it mean? Damnation. Damnation. Condemnation, right? If I am mad at someone and say, damn you, what am I saying? I'm literally, and God forbid, if I say his name, condemn them. Right. Think about it. What am I saying? I'm asking God, you know, think about how many of these phrases there are. The D word that I just said, GD. Go to H-E double hockey sticks. <laughs> right? What am I saying when I say that? You're condemning them. We're saying, God, this person is not worth having in heaven. Please destroy them for my benefit. You know, 
I think sometimes our problem is we're so accustomed to doing things and we don't listen to ourselves when we're doing them. Right? Right? And I, again, I apologize, but I think we need to be real. We need to hear ourselves and know what we're saying. Okay? What are we doing when we say all these things? We are literally cursing a person to go to hellfire, a soul for whom Christ has died. Is there ever in the history of the world before now, now, or any time after, is there ever a time where it's appropriate to say such a thing? The opposite. We're supposed to be trying to save us. All I can say is like the Apostle Paul, God forbid. Did God put us here to curse people? No, he put us here to bless people, to be a blessing. Proverbs 12, 18 says, There is that speaketh like the piercing of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. Now that verse is not necessarily talking about curse words, but it sure fits, doesn't it? There are words that cut like a sword. What happens if I cut you with a sword? Really? What happens? You know? Most of the people that have been cut by swords have died. True? But it says that the tongue of the wise is health. What would that make the tongue that's like a sword? Death. death. What's the opposite of health? It's death, isn't it? So what's the lesson here? How about stay with the health message? 1 Peter 3.10 For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no Guile. Um, again, not necessarily talking about curse words. There's other ways that this could be done, but it sure fits with our subject, doesn't it? And especially that last line, and his lips, that they speak no guile. What is guile? Lies. Deceit, right? That makes me think about Revelation 14 and verse 5. The prophecy about the last days. It says, and in their mouth, who are they in this Bible verse? Do you know? The 144,000. That's the subject of chapter 14 of Revelation is the 144,000. It says, and in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Do you realize that this is the very Bible verse before the everlasting gospel message of Revelation 14 and verse 6 through 12? It's the very verse before. Don't you think that that gives it special purpose here? It's the 144,000. What are they to us? Why, why should we care about the 144,000 and any special instructions about them? They follow the Lamb whithersoever He goes. They follow the Lamb. I like your answers. There's a lot of good ones. They follow the Lamb whithersoever He goes. And we are supposed to strive to be one of them, right? And so... The 144,000 stand before God without fault. Isn't that what it says? Without fault before the throne of God. They stand before God without a mediator at the very end, don't they? That's what it's talking about here. <clears throat> and they have no God in their mouths. Folks, if we don't let Jesus do this for us, Will we be able to give the everlasting gospel message to the world? No. And we sure won't be able to stand with the 144,000, will we? 
Jesus in Matthew 5, 22 said, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. We talked about that this morning too, didn't we? But he goes on, he says, Whosoever shall say to his brother, Rekha, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. That word reka actually means fool. It means apostate one. When they say fool, what were they saying? If you say thou fool, what are you saying? You're a fool. You're in apostasy. You can't even be saved. You're not even a candidate for salvation. If we talk like that, What's, what does it say about us? We're in, danger of We're in danger of hellfire. But I ask you again, what we just mentioned a minute ago, the GD, the go-to, and the D word, isn't that all just exactly what this is describing? It is. We're saying this person is not worth saving. If we ever think that another person is not worth saving, we ourselves are in danger, Jesus said. He said this to the Pharisees, by the way, who were most guilty of doing just what he's talking about here, right? They had several groups of people that they had already decided were not worthy of wasting their time on. Look. 6, 27, and 28. But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. As far as the literal cursing goes, we are definitely going to be on the receiving end of it, aren't we? According to prophecy and according to what Jesus told us. But when this happens... What are we supposed to do? When they're cursing us, what are we supposed to do to them? Bless them that curse you and pray for them which despitefully use you. And there's just one more Bible verse on this section. Matthew 5, 34, 35 but I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. This is really something altogether different here, this kind of swearing. But I thought it needed a brief mention because I think that over the years, the two have been somewhat confused. There are many who have confused this with some of what we have been talking about. So I just want to hit it right quick. When I was a kid, there were lots of people that would say, I swear. It was just a habitual thing that people did. It, they really weren't swearing about anything. It was just a saying. And it was very common when I was younger. I swear. I swear. I huh? I swear I didn't do it. I swear I didn't do it. I, mean, I had to say that a few times. But um, I swear, and for no apparent reason, folks would say, well, I swear. Can anybody, does anybody remember what I'm talking about? When this was, it was really common. You would see it. I had, I had a lady in my life when I was younger, Ms. Hamby. And her and her habit, she was all the time saying, Well, I swanny. And she had a real southern voice, too. You never heard that, Swanee. A lot of people out there talking about you, or at least they used to. Yeah, when you go to court, you're going to be a witness, you're supposed to say, I swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. That is true. And you know, there are Christians that believe so strongly in this Bible verse that they will not do that. Okay? And I don't really think that's our issue, Thomas. I don't think that Jesus 
intended it for us to, to go to court and not be able to give our oath, to give our testimony. But we should not take it lightly. And that's what a lot of people do. I swear this, I swear that. You know, I cannot tell you how many times I used to watch Cops, the television show. And I cannot tell you how many times I've seen these crack addicts that will say, I swear on my mother's life. I swear on my children's life. It's really common. You hear it a lot. Like that's going to impress you. Oh, well, if they'll swear on their children's, they must be telling the truth. No, folks. When you say something fool like that, the, the officer knows you're guilty. Because nobody in their right mind would say such a fool thing. But that's where we are today. You know, they, it's really taken lightly. And I believe what Jesus is trying to say is, your, you know, we used to say your word is your bond, right? Used to, you didn't have to have a contract. A handshake would do, right? And it's because of this idea of believing and loving the truth. There was integrity that just seems to have somehow left us. So, what about taking the oath? I, I, there are actually spirit of prophecy statements that kind of clear that one up for us. But it's, it's not really wrong for you to go to court and you know take that oath to tell the truth. But, you know, if you went to court and you just willy-nilly said, yeah, I take your oath, and then didn't tell the truth? How, can you, how do you think? I know it would be perjury under the law, but how do you think Jesus would do that? It's, it, it's definitely not the way things should be. All right, part three. Just plain old foul language or dirty words. Once known as four-letter words in the world, world I grew up in, they were called four-letter words. Unfortunately, that doesn't do the job anymore. Some of them are four-syllabled words. <laughs> Ephesians 4, verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. Does it say it's just a good word? It's good to the what? Use of edifying. What is edifying? Lifting up. Lifting up. Building up. You know, Paul talks about people tearing the church down or edifying the church, which is building the church up. Or strengthening. Strengthening. Encouraging would be a good word that would, uh, that would work in this. We should be building one another up. We should be holding one another up. We should be encouraging one another up, shouldn't we? Right. But it says that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And then look at verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. What happens if we do this ugly habit that's being talked about here. We just might grieve the Holy Spirit of God away, right? Again, God forbid. Read it for me, Todd. I don't have it. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you all with mouth. Amen. Amen. Goes very well. Luke 6, verse 45. Jesus said, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. And then he says, The principle being, For of the abundance of the heart, what? His mouth speaketh. When we say bad words, where is it coming from? From the heart. And is the heart right there? <laughs> I mean, it, 
It's true, isn't it? We do think, you know, I love you with all my heart. But, but it really is our minds, isn't it? As a man thinketh, so is he. That's exactly right. So when we say bad words, they're coming from our brains. And you know, we say what goes up must come down. What goes in must come out. <laughs> out of the abundance of heart and mouth speaks. But I do want to qualify that. What goes in must come out unless God changes us. Amen. All right? There's new stuff going in. And, but there is going to be some new stuff put in. You better believe it. That's exactly right. But somehow, you know, we, we need to pray for a miracle that the evil things that are stored up inside of us, because and my hard drive is pretty full. Okay? Well, I need some brainwashing. Huh? Well, I need some brainwashing. We need some brainwashing. Amen to that. <laughs> Not the kind that they talk about, but but we need some washing um, of the water by the word or something close to that, right? So, does it really matter? Does this subject really matter? Matthew 15, 11, Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. You know, Jesus was being questioned by the Pharisees about some ceremonial washing of the plates and the cups. And, and you know, he was letting them know uh, that the way they viewed everything was upside down, wasn't it? But it's one thing to worry about what we're putting into our bodies. And folks, we think that's very important, don't we? Okay, so I'm not belittling that at all. I think it's real important. But Jesus himself said that it's way more important what's coming out of our mouths. It's not food that comes out. It's these words. Ephesians 5, verse 3 and 4. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. Now this starts to give us some help here. Um, if we speak spent more time putting good stuff in, what would we get out? Good. If we spent more time praising the Lord, what would we have time to say, to talk about? Just praises. Just praises. That's exactly right. Now, I can't leave this one. <laughs> this is not my name. And I know they weren't talking about me <laughs> when they said it. But some people call it preacher's cuss words. First word that I put on the list is swan. <laughs> Just because of Miss Handy all those years ago, right? Um, I heard about another man who would say, Boulder! <laughs> Boulder being one of the largest dams in the United States. You know, it's silly. I think of that word because my football coach, when I went to the Christian high school, and he was good. We won, we won a state championship five years in a row, and I got to be on one of those. But um, he would scream and holler and tirade on us and every other word seemed to be that word. <laughs> and it's a preacher's cuss word. Why did why did the coach at the Christian school say that word? And not say the word You know, he wanted to keep his job. You're right about that, but but you know, it's 
It's a softened version of it. But does it mean anything any different? No. So are we learning something about these softened versions? Are they okay or are they just as bad? And this is a hard lesson for, for folks that grew up in the streets like me to learn. But it's true. Sugar is another one. Um, sugar. Well, you know what that was supposed to be. It doesn't take a rocket scientist. And, of course, there's another one. You got two different versions of the other word, and somehow these are better, right? I only put that up there. I haven't heard anybody say that in a long time, but I used to, you would hear people actually say the initials, exclaim them as a cuss word. And that one too. I haven't heard that in a long, long time. The reason I put them on my list is because we as Christians would obviously be offended by those, right? Any version of that would offend us. Any version of that. Um, and somehow or another, I do hear people say that with a middle initial. Right? God knows what I'm talking about. So, But I put those up there to say this. Is that any different? I'm not sure if I smelled it, spelled it right, but maybe it was a maybe it was a J instead of a G. I don't know. I think it's G E E. Yeah. G E. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, mine is kind of an embellished version anyway. I remember back in the day, people would say, "Goodness." Well, you know, is it hard to figure out who that one is? Is that not a form of God's name? We're just trying to slip it under the radar, right? Yeah. What about that? How much goodness do we have? Who is goodness? God is good. God is good. And so, anybody remember gracious? Sometimes you put the two together. That's right, goodness gracious. But who is goodness and who is gracious? It's God. So again... Are we taking God's name in vain? Doggone. Isn't it interesting? You turn God around and it's, instead of G-O-D, it's D-O-G. And the dog's gone. And instead of G-D, it's D-G. That's not all that hard to figure out, is it? How about Dad Blaine? <laughs> Who's that? Who's that? God is our Father. And if we're telling God our Father to blame somebody, what are we telling them? Is it any different than this? I mean, it's, it's the same garbage, isn't it? And then... I just, got, I just got four of them up there. But there's probably 14 that I've heard recently. All these F words. And it kills us. But our grandkids come to the house and they say these makeshift F words as, I mean, just like breathing. They don't know that there's anything wrong with it. They have no clue. And here we are trying to educate. So what do we need to do with the preacher's cuss words, folks? Clean them out. Get rid of them. Wow. One more I have realized and I used it was tarnation. Tarnation, that is another one. It's just a, another form of damnation. That's exactly right. Yeah, 
you know, like I say, a lot of this, if we would truly think about it, that would cure some of it. Psalms 19, verse 14, folks. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And I'm going to be the first one to tell you, mine has not. This is my prayer. This is what I need. So let's trade in our old four-letter words for some new ones, okay? There's a lot of good four-letter words like love, pray, holy, amen. amen. <laughs> That's a good one. But in closing, this was supposed to be a practical message. So let's get practical. What do we do? Number one, make your decision. Use the brain that God gave you. That's what my mother used to tell me. God gave you a perfectly good brain. Use it. So use the brain that God gave you to examine the evidence that we've looked at here today. The reason we have Bible studies like this is to make sure that we understand the truth of God's Word, right? Yeah. But what good does it do if we understand it and we don't follow what we have learned? Is it any good? No, that doesn't do us any good. In fact, it makes us more responsible, right? Makes us more accountable for what we know. So make your decision. Number two, Read the Bible often. God's words are like ivory soap. Amen. They purify your heart and uplift your thoughts. Through the Bible, we get a clear picture of Jesus. Amen? And it's by beholding we become changed. Yes, Todd? I think of Psalms 119.11, a lot of times, specifically here. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Well, I tell you, um, Psalm 51 is the one that's been working on me an awful lot lately. And it fits in with this very well, too. That's a brainwashing. Amen. That's the kind of brainwashing we want, isn't it? Hold it, Pastor. Cool it. Cool it. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm talking about the whole chapter. Yeah. I'm talking about the whole chapter. Um and I won't try to do that. I just I would just flub it up. Yeah. But um, it has become a sincere prayer of mine. And it's and it's really Psalms 51. It's it's no particular part of Psalm 51 because when you read the whole thing, oh man, it it just really shows me some things. Um, and number three, follow Paul's advice. So I got some Bible verses. What do we do? What practical things can we do to change our situation? And here you go. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 Pray without ceasing. If we prayed without ceasing, are we going to forget in the middle of our prayer and cuss at somebody? I sure hope not. I sure hope not. 1 Corinthians 9.25 and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now, probably there's another Bible study in this because if we're temperate in all things, I bet all the different things that we have problems with would be easier. Right? Because one thing feeds another, doesn't it? And so, I like that Bible verse for that purpose, but I also just plain we're supposed to strive to be one of the 144,000. Is this thing we're talking about today worth striving for? Amen. What does it mean to strive? Struggle. Hard. Hard. Uh, yeah, it's a struggle. It's like working at something. You know, it doesn't just come natural, does it? We've got... We, 
We have to be diligent. We have to stay at it. Maybe we won't get well at all at once. Maybe we'll just get a little better day by day. Maybe, praise the Lord, it'll be one of those things where one day we'll look up and say, praise the Lord, I don't do that anymore. Amen. Amen. So strive for the mastery. Paul said they do it to attain a corruptible crown. So we'll go to work and we'll strive for things. Or we'll go to the gym and we'll strive for something. Well, what we're talking about here is infinitely more important than either one of those, right? And last but not least, Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, Think on these things. That Bible verse helps in two different ways. Because obviously, if we put more good stuff in, are we going to get more good stuff out? All right. And so that, that comes into play there. But folks, think on these things. You know, think about it. Taking God's name in vain. I know nobody in here wants to be guilty of that. And I'm not talking about OMG. I'm talking about being a false, a hypocrite Christian. Nobody wants to, to do that. Right? And then what about the cursing and the swearing? Where you're actually cursing somebody. If we're thinking on good things, you know, I'm thinking about this old song Jake Hess sung. He said, you know, in the different verses do different things, but one of them is like people fighting all the time. And he says, you know, I've never seen anybody get in a fight when they were singing a song. Mm -hmm. You know, is that not good counsel for this? Yeah. Should we not have a song in our heart? Song is the is the handiest way to praise God, isn't it? Yeah. And so if we're constantly praying and we're constantly praising, we're not going to have time for the foolish stuff, are we? If there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. 